Your Excellency, Minister Arrumi, there are Mr. Commissioner Paolo Blisenti, ambassadors, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to introduce my reflections on the relevance of women in institutions with two images. One taken from the Italian Parliament, the Chambers of Deputies, and the other that circulated in the social media a few weeks ago. There is a gallery in Palazzo di Montecitorio in Rome with black and white portraits of 21 women. Uh, there were this, those women who contributed to the work of the Italian Constituent Assembly June, starting in June the 2nd, 1946, the day of women enfranchisement in Italy, and the very same day that 21 women have been elected in the Constituent Assembly. The second image is much more recent. It was the end of January this year when a picture circulated representing the President of the European Commission, the President of the European Parliament, and the President of the European Central Bank together. Three women at the top of the highest EU institutions. I am mentioning these images because they cover a span of time, 1946-2022, almost 75 years, that outlines a journey, a journey made of stops and go, an historical journey through times and achievements, a journey through opportunities and barriers, a journey through obstacles that have been removed, but also through impediments, mainly cultural impediments that still remain. An ongoing journey to be continued every day by all men and women at all latitudes. Much has changed in women condition in public sphere. However, we still feel the necessity to focus on women's status in institutions on this day, the very day universally dedicated to women. And as a matter of fact, the election or the appointment of a woman at the head of an institution still make the headlines. And this means that there is yet a long way to go. The figures confirm that uh, there is still a wide gender gap in public institution. On average, parliaments across the EU member states uh, have only 32% of seats held by women, according to the latest data of the European Institute of Gender Equality. No parliament across Europe has a majority of women. Sweden is the closest to parity with 49.6%. If we focus on the judicial division, according to the latest report by CEPEJ, European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice, women made up 61% of the judiciary, ranging from 81% in Latvia to 33% in the United Kingdom. And yet, at the judicial top levels and Supreme Court levels, the figures are reversed. Women are still underrepresented as the chief of courts and chief public prosecutors, confirming that the higher the hierarchical level, the lower the number of women. And my country is no exception. These figures provide an opportunity for some reflection I would like to briefly address three points. First, why 
parity in institutions matters. Second, how does the current context impact on gender equality? Third, what are the persistent obstacles to an effective equality? So first, why parity in institutions matters? There is a number of good reasons for insisting on gender parity in institutions. It is a matter of human dignity, it is a matter of equality, it is a matter of democracy. But let me provide an answer to this question with the story of Ayesha Malik, the first female Supreme Court judge in Pakistan. I too have experienced the condition of being the only woman sitting in a court, but indeed the context was not comparable to hers. Ayesha Malik's appointment was fiercely opposed. She has been physically in danger but she was able to write an important page of the history of women's rights in her country when, last year, she stopped the execution of a virginity test on a girl. That decision was a turning point in the life of that girl, indeed, and it was also a crack in a well-established tradition that is precisely where the main prejudices are rooted. Effective gender equality needs women in the institutions ready to stand for women's rights. Let me go back to my country. Those 21 women sitting in the Italian Constituent Assembly have struggled in order to have a provision on gender parity in institution. Article 51 reads, any citizen of either gender is eligible for public offices and elected position on equal grounds according to the condition established by law. And this was the result of the work of those women in the Constituent Assembly. And yet, it was not enough. It took several more years, 15 more years, before one woman could access the judiciary. And it was necessary, a decision of the Constitutional Court and a piece of legislation enacted by the Parliament. This means, and I conclude on this first point, that Equality in laws, equality on paper, is necessary, but it is not enough. Equality is a day-by-day -day achievement. It is always, always an unfinished business, calling for women in institutions always alert. This brings us to the second question. How does the current context affect the gender gap in institutions and culture? I would like to start with a neologism. She session. She session. Created by Nicole Mason, president of the Institute for Women's Policy Research, this expression is meant to indicate the crisis, the recession, that women have to face as a side effect of the pandemic. In my country, Italy, for example, in recent months there have been a relevant increase in the GDP and in the number of employed people. But, in contrast, there is a decrease in opportunities for women. Let me also stress once again that the pandemic has also aggravated not only in general the women's condition, but also the figure concerning gender-based violence. History shows that international crises typically impose 
a heavier burden on women's shoulders. According to the Global Gender Gap 2021, an index by the World Economic Forum, the pandemic has dramatically delayed the reduction in the gender gap and further extended the time needed to achieve complete gender equality in the world. It is now estimated that it will require 135 years, 36 years longer than recently estimated. And indeed, the news and the dramatic images coming from Ukraine cause further concerns for this kind of relapse in the long run. In this scenario, the words many decades ago of former US Attorney General Robert Kennedy at the University of Georgia, 1961, still resound today. He stated, and I quote, on our generation falls the full burden of proving to the world that we really mean it when we say that all men are created free and equal before the law. Unquote. The famous statement of the Declaration of Independence 1766, 1766, all men are created equal, is a goal yet and always to be achieved. I come to the third and last point of my speech. So what are the persistent obstacles to an effective equality? In most countries, legal barriers have been gradually removed. Open, direct discrimination are almost unsustainable in front of the public opinion. Yet, it is the cultural barriers and social prejudices that are most difficult to remove. This is true everywhere in the world, with different tones and nuances. These prejudices are evidence in the semantics of public debate, where there are still too many who believe that women should be the dea tacita, the silent godness on the classic myth, punished for talking too much. It is evident when a woman is transparent in official international meetings or is relegated to a separate sofa apart from the chairs reserved for institutional representative, has happened to President of the European Commission Ursula von der Leyen. It is evident, as is happening in my country, when a decision of the Constitutional Court dated 2016 that gives the parents the possibility of giving their child the mother's surname is still to be implemented. These stereotypes and prejudices are not only a matter of parity. They are a matter of civilization. As the French philosopher Charles Fourier wrote two centuries ago, quote, the degree of emancipation of women is the natural measure of general emancipation, unquote. There is still a long way to go everywhere. Let me conclude by ideally taking you back to that gallery of the Chamber of Deputies in Italy. I too had the privilege of being portrayed in that gallery as the first female president of the Constitutional Court together with the first women ministers and the first women presidents of the Chamber and the Senate. But in front of our pictures, on a different wall, there are two empty mirrors. 
and an inscription reading, quote, no woman has yet been prime minister or president of the republic. Why two mirrors? These mirrors are there so that every girl or every young woman visiting that gallery can watch her own face in the mirror and, who knows, may be inspired to make a professional choice that will eventually bring her into institutional life. Those mirrors are an invitation, a call addressed to every young woman that say, you can make it. And I repeat, you can make it. Thank you so much.